you can see what's happening and what God is doing here. Thomas Eric, right? Okay. Thomas Eric, Admiral, if you lean him over. I baptize you as a covenant child in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a towel that's given to you by the church to commemorate this. And this is a flashcard of the catechism so that you can use to instruct him growing up. We expect him to know that by next week. <laughs> and I have, you can return to your seats, but when you return, would you please stand? Would congregation, would you please stand with Drew and Megan? For this doesn't just happen for the family, this happens for the whole household of God. And I have a question for you, and if you're so minded, please answer, we do, God helping us. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive this child in love, to pray for Thomas, to help care for his instruction in the faith, to encourage and sustain him in the fellowship of believers? People of God, what is your answer? We do, God helping us. Let's remain standing and pray a prayer of thanksgiving to our God together. Let us pray. Almighty God and merciful Father, we thank and praise you that you have forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. You received us through your Holy Spirit as members of your only begotten Son, has so adopted us as your children. And you sealed and confirmed this to us by holy baptism. We earnestly pray through your beloved Son that you will always govern this child by your Holy Spirit. May Thomas be nurtured in the Christian faith and in godliness and grow and develop in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that he may see your fatherly goodness and mercy, which you have shown to him and to us all. And may he live in all righteousness under our only teacher, king, and high priest, Jesus Christ. Give him the courage to fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion. May he forever praise and magnify you and your Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one and only true God. Amen. As a song of response... Can As we go to open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you are the light of the minds that know you, the life of the souls that love you, and the strength of the wills that serve you. So help us to know you so that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may fully serve you, whom to serve is perfect freedom. So speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to Mark chapter 2. To Mark chapter 2. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here today. Uh, we've been considering a series through the book of Mark, and we've come to the end of chapter 2. You can find that on page 1065 of most of our Pew Bibles. Mark is the second book of the New Testament between Matthew and Luke. And so we're going to consider together the last few verses of the chapter 2, verses 23 through the end of the chapter. And so that's what I I'm going to read, and that's what we'll consider together so as we hear the reading of the word of God, let's pay careful attention to it, for it is his own word. One Sabbath, he, that is Jesus, was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Uh, we've noted time and time again as we've gone through this section of Mark's gospel that these are a series of stories that talk about the conflict Jesus had with the religious authorities of his time. 
And not only has that, con- that conflict been continuing, it's also been escalating. Um, the conflict has become more and more serious, and we've reached really the critical point of conflict in the story. There will be conflict in this, in this true story and in the story to follow over the Sabbath. And that is where the conflict in Mark's gospel reaches its high point. Um, there will be a conflict in this story, and Lord willing, we'll consider next time the story that follows, which is also a conflict over the Sabbath day. And it's after that second conflict that they are minded to destroy Jesus for what he's been doing and teaching. So we're to see this, these conflicts escalating and it reaching its, its apex, its critical point here now at a dispute over the Sabbath day. Um, over the Sabbath day. What Jesus does, what his disciples are doing, on the Sabbath day is going to prompt this question from the Pharisees that is going to lead to an opportunity for Jesus to teach. Uh, One of the wonderful things we've seen through these conflicts is that Christ has always been able to turn them to a proper instruction to his disciples of what kind of work he's doing as king and what kind of kingdom he's bringing. And this conflict is no different. Uh, The Lord will use this to show his authority over even the Sabbath day, and to teach the true meaning of the Sabbath day to his disciples. So how does Jesus communicate this this truth to us in these verses? Well, we see it happening first through a flawed premise that the Pharisees raise about the keeping of the law. Second, Jesus will respond with a former precedent from Scripture that's to be applied in this situation. And finally, he will make a festive proclamation concerning the Sabbath and its true nature. Um, And so that's how we want to think about this text together, to see the flawed premise of the Pharisees, to see the former precedent that Jesus brings and the festive proclamation he makes concerning the Sabbath. So flawed premise, a former precedent, and a festive proclamation. Uh, the, the passage begins with Jesus' disciples going through a field and plucking heads of grain. Um, this was permitted under the law. Uh, the law particularly said you can go through someone's peel, field and pick little heads of grain as you go. That's okay. Um, you can't take a sickle to someone else's crop, but you can pick heads of grain as you go through their field. So the problem is not what they do. Deuteronomy twenty three twenty five said it's fine to do what they're doing. The problem the Pharisees have is not what the disciples are doing, going along and picking these heads of grain, but the fact that they're doing it on the Sabbath. So this is probably taking place around April or May. This is probably, you can imagine, the disciples walking through a grain field, maybe of of wheat or barley, and as they go along, they're just taking little heads of grain and eating them. And the Pharisees see them doing this, and they see them doing it on the Sabbath, and they say to themselves, this is not right. This is not right to do on the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath day was an important day in Judaism. It was one of the distinguishing marks. It was one of the things that really set them apart in the world as the people of God, that they observed the Sabbath day, that they kept it holy. They changed how they acted on the seventh day of the week. And that stood out with the people around them. That really identified them in a particular way as the people of God. Um, And as, as those kinds of things go that can be badges that identify us as being different from other people, that can be associated with a certain amount of pride. Um, And the problem was in Judaism that this religious observance was also a matter of national pride. Uh, They took pride in the fact that they acted differently on the Sabbath than other people did. And so it was important to them as a community that people participated in the Sabbath day, that they observed the Sabbath day. And although everyone was agreed that this was important for the people of God to observe this day and to keep it holy... They were not all agreed on how the day was to be kept holy. They were not all agreed on what can and can't be done on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees at Jesus' time represented about a 200-year-old tradition at that time of thinking about the Sabbath day, thinking about how to apply that law from the Old Testament regarding the Sabbath. And there was a whole 
set of rules about what could and couldn't be done that had been established by the Pharisaical camp that they would argue for as the proper application of the Sabbath. Um, And that Pharisaic tradition has really survived in Judaism. That Orthodox Judaism can be seen as being in that trajectory, and it can get very specific as to its rules. We see that in in today's way that they talk. In one of the commentaries I read this week, they cited a, a conversation with a rabbi where they had said, is it a violation of the Sabbath to load your dishwasher on the eve of the Sabbath? And his answer was, it's a violation of the Sabbath if you organize the dishes as you put them in the dishwasher. But if you just put them in pell-mell, that's not a violation of the Sabbath day. If you put them in at random, that's okay. If you organize them, that's work. Now that sounds very nitpicky, doesn't it? It sounds very um, surprising to us. Almost we might be tempted to think it's arbitrary or, you know, nonsensical. But I bet if you spoke with that rabbi and said, now, well, how do you apply that principle? He could take you to Old Testament principles, teaching of rabbis in the tradition, and say, this is how you get there. This is how you can decide what is and isn't work. But you can see how that lends itself to being very narrow and specific about different interpretations of what the law requires. And that's really what we're seeing going on in this passage. Why are the Pharisees upset that a disciple would just pick a little head of grain off a stalk of wheat that's ripe for harvest? Well, because they would say reaping is forbidden on the Lord's Day. You can't go reap your fields on the Lord's Day. And to take that piece of grain is reaping. And if you took a little piece of grain, it would be surrounded by a little bit of chaff. So in that day, if you picked a little head of wheat off of the wheat and then you had it chaff, you would rub it in your hands just to get the chaff off of it and you would pop it in your mouth. Well, rubbing the chaff off, that's threshing the grain. Uh, Much like you might do with a peanut that you eat out of a shell when you take it out of the shell. And the boys and girls, maybe you've eaten a peanut and had that little skin that's on it that you just kind of flick off in your hand before you eat the peanut. Um, that's what they would have done with the grain. Just flick it off a little bit before they popped in their mouth. Well, the Pharisees would have said, that's threshing. And reaping is a work forbidden on the Sabbath. Threshing is a work forbidden on the Sabbath. And so they would look at what the disciples are doing, and then they would look at Jesus and say, well, he's their master. What is he going to say to them about this? He's their rabbi. How is he going to instruct them concerning the Sabbath day? And apparently one of their big problems was Jesus seems to see what they're doing and not make any comment about it. And that's what really brings up their question of verse 24. How can you see your disciples doing, working, threshing on the Sabbath, which you know is not permitted, and just let them do it? They're saying, Jesus, you're complicit in their law-breaking by not correcting them, by not talking to them about what they're doing. They're doing something that is, literally what they say is not permitted. It's not lawful. It's not permitted on the Sabbath. Um, And that's how they come and how they approach Jesus. And of course, what Jesus is going to say is, you're making an assumption. You're making an assumption that what they're doing is not permitted. What really they're raising is a question of permission. And the flaw in their premise is to say what we don't permit, God doesn't permit. Our interpretation of the law is binding. Our interpretation of the law is how the law must be read. And Jesus is going to come and say that premise is flawed. Your interpretation of the law does not mean that's God's intention in the law. And what the Pharisees need to be told by Christ is, your interpretation and God's intention are not the same things. And if it was God's intention to forbid that kind of work on the Sabbath day, you'd be right, it's not permitted. But you've confused your interpretation with God's intention in giving this law. And so Jesus will show them the flaw in their premise by turning to a former precedent from Scripture. 
he will turn them to a place in Scripture that applies to this particular situation. And it's an ingenious place to go because it's a time in Scripture where something was done that clearly violated the letter of the law, and yet God approved of it. And Jesus will cite this former precedent uh, that he talks about in this passage. And he said to them, have you never read? That would have been a really biting thing to say to someone who would be an expert in the Bible. right? Someone who's supposed to be an expert in the Bible is quite something to say to them. Have you never read? Um, have you never read 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6? All of them would have said, of course we've read it. We've even read it in Hebrew, which is less impressive for them, but still. Right? We, we've read it. Sure, we've read it. A lot of them probably had it memorized. Right? If, if we weren't talking about this passage, if someone just came up to you and says, what does 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6 talk about? We might have to scratch our heads for a while before we came up with it. I bet a number of these Pharisees, if you'd have said that, they'd have said, I, I know what that passage is about. Um, it, was a, it was an incident that's recorded there during the time of Abiathar, the high priest. It was, it was remembered as his time because he was the only survivor of King Saul's slaughter of the priests at Nob. It was his time, the time of Abiathar, when actually it was his father who David came to when he was hungry, looking to inquire of the Lord, and he was without food, and he asked the priest Ahimelech, do you have any food here? And he said, the only food we have is the bread of the presence, the bread that was in the tabernacle, um, on the table of presence. And it was only permitted by the law for the priest to eat that bread. But yet when David came and he was in need and he was hungry, the high priest gave him the bread to eat. Gave it to him for him and his men. And this is what makes this such an ingenious passage for Jesus to cite. Because the Pharisees love to debate. Right? They love to debate. How do we interpret the law? How do we debate these things? They always wanted to enter into the debate. And maybe they expected Jesus would enter into the debate with them over the Sabbath day. Jesus sweeps away the whole matter of the debate. And he cites something where he says, now, you're talking about an interpretation of the law, but let's look at something that was clearly said in the law. Only the priests can eat the showbread. And yet when David comes hungry and in need, and that's the only bread the priest has to give him, the priest gave it to him. And he ate it, and the men with him ate it, and God approved of that. It's not remembered in Scripture as a sin of Ahimelech the high priest or a sin of David. It's commended. In fact, for that act of faithfulness to David, Ahimelech will lose his life. And so Jesus cites this passage and says, have you never read... That there was a time when something was done that the law forbade, but God approved of it? And what is the lesson to be learned from that? That God's intention in the law is what he wants preserved. Why was that bread there in the tabernacle? Why were there always to be 12 loaves of fresh bread on the table? It was to remind God's people that their God was with them and that his presence was life-sustaining. That they had a God who was with them who would always provide them their daily bread. That's what the bread in the tabernacle was meant to remind them of. Twelve, twelve loaves of bread to rem- for every tribe of Israel to remind that our God is a God who provides for his people who is with us and and is with us with that life-sustaining presence. And what Jesus invites the Pharisees to do is enter into that mental exercise of saying, what would have happened if there was this bread testifying God's God's life-sustaining presence to his people, and here had come his anointed one, David, hungry and in need, inquiring of the Lord, and God had turned him away unfed. It would have broken the whole intention of what the showbread was there to show. 
would have broken God's whole intention in the law. And the high priest recognized that. He said there's something greater going on here. There is the anointed one of God that needs support for him and his men on his mission. And here is bread. The intention of God is to show himself as a God who provides in need. If his anointed one, his king, comes in need and is turned away, what message will that send? And so he gave him the bread. He gave him the bread and and David gave it to his men. And God approved of what they did. It showed several principles. One, that human need takes priority over the ceremonial law. But deeper, that God wants the intention of his law preserved. And Jesus says, the problem with you is you've fundamentally misunderstood what the Sabbath is for. And all of your regulations have done nothing but cloud the beauty of what God has intended. And so he introduces this passage to say there is a time when God's intention in the law can be obscured if you would demand too attentive details to the ceremonies. And it would have been a biting condemnation to the Pharisees. They would have seen how he's maneuvering this argument. Because Jesus is essentially saying, you've obscured the whole purpose for which the Lord has given this day. You've made the Sabbath about rules. About strict rules of how far you can go. Of what you can do. You know, so, so you're saying things like, you're allowed to go 3,049 and a half feet on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to pick a head of grain because that's technically reaping. That's technically threshing. And God, God's saying in this passage, you've reduced it to that's what the Sabbath is about. And Jesus is going to come with this festive proclamation to say, that is not what the Sabbath is about. The Sabbath is actually about what God has done for his people. That really is the beginning of the festive proclamation that he makes about the Sabbath in verse 27. Where he says, you know what needs to be restored to the people? To know that we have a God who has made this day for us. That the Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. God God didn't make us to just keep all these little rules he's made. As if God is just the great arbitrary rule maker in heaven. He likes to make all of these nitpicky little rules to have everyone follow. Jesus says you're completely missing why God gave the Sabbath. The intention of God in the Sabbath needs to be preserved and recovered. He made it for us. He made it for our blessing. What is the Sabbath for? It's for the rest of God's people. That we can rest from our ordinary labors. The point of the Sabbath is not, not, don't work. That's part of the Sabbath. But what is the point of the Sabbath? It's that God wants us to stop doing our ordinary work so that we can rest and come together and do a holy work. A holy work of fellowshipping with God, of fellowshipping with one another, so that through that rest, we might be refreshed. That's what God made this day for. It was a day that was needed even when the world was holy. Even when the world was not yet fallen, there was still a need for a day to take part, to take away from your ordinary work that you were doing. Even in a holy world for Adam and Eve before the fall, there was a need for them to take a day where they stopped doing the ordinary work that God called them to do and do that extraordinary work of worship. 
of just taking time to fellowship with God, resting from their ordinary work and fellowshipping with Him so that they would be refreshed in their souls. Creation testified, mankind needs that. Even in a holy world, creation testifies, mankind needs to take time with their God. That God had set apart a day that was consecrated for him. That's part of what it means to make something holy. Set it apart. That was what God is doing in the baptism of Thomas this morning. He is setting him apart from all the other children of the world and identifying him particularly as belonging to him. And Thomas is not just set apart, he's set apart for service. I can talk about Thomas because he doesn't get embarrassed. Um, other people might be embarrassed if I talked about them particularly. He's okay. Um, but right, he's set apart for service. We read about what God promises and the obligations of the sacrament, right? That there, there are obligations put on Thomas to serve the Lord, and we're to help instruct him with his parents on how to serve the Lord. And the Holy Sabbath day was like that. It was set apart for the service to the Lord. And even Adam and Eve needed that in creation before the fall. A day where they just took time away from their ordinary work and spent time with God. Spent time with God's people together with Him. Fellowshipping with Him. And that's how they were refreshed, body and soul, in communion with God. And if that was needed in creation, how much more is it needed after the fall? When our ordinary labor becomes difficult. When we labor not in a holy world, but in a fallen world. How much more important is it to come and remember redemption? To remember that there is a rest coming for the people of God who are laboring in this sin-cursed and fallen world. It's interesting, the law of God holds up both of those, creation and redemption, when it talks about the Sabbath day. In Exodus 20, why do we keep the Sabbath day holy? It looks to creation. And Deuteronomy 5, where the Ten Commandments are repeated when the Sabbath prohibition is given, or what we're to do on the Sabbath, that commandment contains not just a reference to creation, it also contains a reference to slavery. It reminds God's people, you're to let your household rest, and you're to do that because you need to remember you were slaves in Egypt. And God brought you out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So let your household rest as you do. There's not just see a reference to creation in that. There's a reference to redemption in that. You were slaves and now you're not. That's something to remember on the Sabbath day. Uh, We rest to remember God's creative work. We rest and we remember God's redemptive work. We need that. Especially in a fallen world. To take a day where we take a rest from our ordinary labor and fellowship with our God and find refreshment for our souls in that fellowship. That was God's intention in giving this day to us. That it would be a joy. That it would be a delight. Not that it would be a burden. In fact, the burden comes from not doing what God wants us to do. That's Isaiah's point in Isaiah 58, 13, and 14. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Why did God encourage them to spend the day as he had decreed, not as they wanted to to handle it? Because he said, if you do what I've told you to do, it will be a blessing to you. It will be a delight to you. You will find refreshment for your souls. That's why God has given us this day, for our joy, for our delight, that we might find refreshment in fellowship with our God. 
That's what the intention of the Sabbath has always been. And that's why Jesus comes to the Pharisees and says, all of your debates, all of your rules do nothing but obscure God's good intention for this day. It makes it all about something that God is not about. It takes all of that that's supposed to be a blessing and it turns it into a burden. Just it makes God the God of no. And makes us only focus on what we can't do. And Jesus is just sweeping aside all of their debates. Saying, I am not getting into the debate you've been having for centuries over what exactly is allowed on the Sabbath day or not. I'm not entering into the debate. Because you've mistaken me for yet another teacher of the law. And Jesus is going to come with a radical declaration of his authority in verse 28. It was radical enough for the Pharisees that he comes and says, I know what the Sabbath is about. You don't. That was a radical claim of knowing more than they knew. But if verse 27 is a radical claim, verse 28 is even more radical. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That is a radical declaration of Christ's authority. As one commentator said, the Sabbath was the most sacred of divine institutions. They looked up to the Sabbath as one of the most sacred things that God had given them. And Jesus comes and says, I am sovereign over the Sabbath. That's a claim that you can hardly make more radical. Because if he is sovereign over the most holy and divine of the institutions they have, then he's sovereign over everything. And that's what he's saying as the Son of Man. I am sovereign over all. I don't come as a teacher of the law to debate about the Sabbath. I come to tell you authoritatively what the Sabbath is for because it's my Sabbath. That's a radical claim of authority. That's what the Son of Man does. We talked about how Jesus liked this title as one that had all the messianic clarity with none of the messianic confusion of his day. It's clear what authority the Son of Man comes with from Daniel 7.14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. He's talking about his authority. But in this, there's a wonderful picture to us, not just of what kind of authority the king has, but what kind of kingdom he's come to bring. What kind of rule he is going to bring into the world. So many people look at this passage and just see the claim of authority. I'm, the, I'm authority. I'm the authority over the Sabbath day. But by claiming to be the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus tells us something important about what kind of king he is. And about what kind of kingdom he's come to bring. Because the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And think with me about the implications of that. If the Sabbath was made for man, and Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, that means the king has given this gift of a day that's for our joy and for our delight, that we might be rested and refreshed. What kind of kingdom does he come with? What kind of king is he? An overbearing king? who comes to impose all sorts of rules and duties on his people? Now what kind of kingdom does he come to bring? He comes to restore the joy and the delight of the kingdom of God to his people. A kingdom where we will not be burdened, but will find rest for our souls. A rest that will refresh us in fellowship with him. He's Lord of the Sabbath, and that's good news because the Sabbath testifies of his concern for us. He made this day for us. 
And if the Sabbath is for us, then the Lord of the Sabbath, who gave it, is clearly for us. Has given us this day that we would fellowship with him. And he's not only for us, he's with us. Another reason the Lord liked to use the, the, the messianic title, Son of Man, was not just because it clearly communicated his authority and his identity, but it also identifies him with us. Right? The Son of God identifies him with God. Son of David identifies him with David. Son of Man identifies himself with us. The king comes to say, the good news is, the Sabbath was made for you. By a God who is for you. And the good news is the God who is for you is now here with you. This is the radical good news of the kingdom of God. That God is for us, that God is with us, and what Jesus Christ has come to do is not be another Pharisee. To load us with a burden of regulation. But he's come to restore the beauty and the luster of of God's kingdom. One commentator here said, that's what Jesus does for the law. He restores the beauty and the luster of the law that's been lost. That the Pharisees clouded over with all their regulations. And Jesus comes like someone who digs a, a gem out of the ground that's covered with dirt and grime, and he cleans it off and says, this is what it is. Shows us the beauty and the luster to say, this is the kind of kingdom I bring, where you will find joy and delight, rest and refreshment for your souls. I love what I read from Ed Clowney. The work of the kingdom is rest. And the kind of rest the kingdom is, king has come to bring is this kind of rest. Dr. Clowney writes, the perfect rest of God that has no ending that hope of heaven awaits us. It is the place where we will enter into, re into the rest of God the creator. A rest in which perfect love will cast out all our fears. A resting place prepared ahead of us by our older brother. Who will wipe away every tear. And a resting place where there will be no more sin or suffering or pain or separation or loneliness. In Christ, we taste already the rest and peace found in his presence. To go and be with Christ is far better. But through the Spirit, we already know the gift of Christ's rest. Do you see why Jesus was so unhappy with the Pharisees who came and just obscured God's good purposes with their rules? How he wanted to restore the beauty and luster of the Sabbath institution? And to say it's a good thing that God has stamped his eternal presence on this world. That there's a day set aside where we go and just reflect on holy things. Rest from our ordinary work and do the extraordinary work of worshiping with one another. Fellowshipping with one another. Serving one another. To find rest from the fatigue physical and spiritual, of this fallen world. And in the Old Testament, it was there to remind God's people there was a rest coming. You work six days in this ordinary labor, and then you rest on the seventh day, and you remember there's a rest coming for the people of God. And Jesus comes to these Pharisees and says, I have come to bring that rest. And we are here not on the seventh day of the week, but on the first. We work out after our rest. And why? Because Jesus has come and established the rest of his kingdom. Through his perfect life and his sacrificial death on the cross and his glorious resurrection, that has begun the rest of the new creation. And he's working, but it's a holy work. He is at rest from what he suffered in this world. And we gather together on this day and remember that he rose from the dead and that that resurrection began that rest we hope for. 
that we who believe in him have already been brought to newness of life in soul, and we look forward to that day when he returns in glory and brings newness to our bodies and our souls. We, we rest on this day, and we worship on this day, and we gather on this day to remind ourselves of the rest that he has accomplished that awaits the people of God. That that rest is not just all future, but it's been begun. That to go and be with Christ is better by far, but to be with Christ now is to know rest. That's why part of the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, is to begin to live now in that eternal Sabbath. To begin it now in our fellowship with one another, our fellowship with our God in service that we would find rest for our souls. And people of God, this is the day that has been consecrated by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that promises us that rest. That all who believe in him will find that rest. And we'll end here, but sometimes people, when we hear the baptismal form read and we have this little baby and we're celebrating the the joy of this occasion in life, we'll look at that prayer we pray talking about this life that is nothing but a constant death. And talking about Pharaoh being drowned in the Red Sea and all these kinds of things. Is that so nice? Or to think about praying for Thomas when he comes to face the Lord in the final judgment. Is that something to think about now at a time when his life is just beginning? But we recognize as God's people we're not living for this life. And the Sabbath day is a wonderful reminder that God has given to us of where our lives end. Of what Christ has come to bring for us. Of what really the kingdom of glory is about. It's about joy. It's about delight. It's about rest for our souls. And refreshment with our God. And if we get a little hint of that on a day like this, how much more will we have when we spend an eternity in fellowship with God and with one another, doing the holy work of the kingdom, which is rest. That's why we began the service with those words from Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you for this day that you have made, that you have consecrated for your service. We thank you that Jesus did not come to abolish the day, but to restore it to its former glory, to show through it the beauty of your provision for us in the creation, that we would find rest and refreshment for our souls. We pray, Father, you would grant we would never be like the Pharisees who made the Sabbath too much about negative prohibitions and external ceremonies, but we would use this day to give you praise and glory. For you've hallowed this day for us, that we might find our joy and delight with you and with those who are yours. So help us, Lord, to find joy in this day, and that the joy of the Lord would truly be our strength. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who has come to redeem us and to restore the Sabbath. Hear us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take up our Psalter hymnals once again, and as a song of response, turn to number 116A, and we'll sing, we'll stand together and sing the first four verses of 116A.
Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with you all. Amen. People of God, go in peace. Thank you.